Chester Allen Arthur was an American attorney and politician who served as the 21st President of the United States. He succeeded James A. Garfield upon the latter's assassination. At the outset, Arthur struggled to overcome a slightly negative reputation, which stemmed from his early career in politics as part of New York's Republican political machine. He succeeded by embracing the cause of civil service reform, his advocacy for, and subsequent enforcement of, the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act was the centerpiece of his administration. Arthur was born in Fairfield, Vermont, grew up in upstate New York, and practiced law in New York City. He served as quartermaster general in the New York militia during the American Civil War. Following the war, he devoted more time to Republican politics and quickly rose in the political machine run by New York Senator Roscoe Conkling, appointed by President Ulysses S. Grant to the lucrative and politically powerful post of collector of the Port of New York in 1871. Arthur was an important supporter of Conkling and the stalwart faction of the Republican Party. In 1878, the new president, Rutherford B. Hayes, fired Arthur as part of a plan to reform the federal patronage system in New York. When Garfield won the Republican nomination for president in 1880, Arthur, an Eastern stalwart, was nominated for vice president to balance the ticket. After just half a year as vice president, Arthur found himself in the executive mansion due to the assassination of his predecessor. To the surprise of reformers, Arthur took up the cause of reform, though it had once led to his expulsion from office. He signed the Pendleton Act into law and strongly enforced its provisions. He gained praise for his veto of a Rivers and Harbors Act that would have appropriated federal funds in a manner he thought excessive. He presided over the rebirth of the United States Navy, but was criticized for failing to alleviate the federal budget surplus, which had been accumulating since the end of the Civil War. Suffering from poor health, Arthur made only a limited effort to secure the Republican Party's nomination in 1884. He retired at the close of his term. Journalist Alexander Mickler later wrote, No man ever entered the presidency so profoundly and widely distrusted as Chester Allen Arthur, and no one ever retired, more generally respected, alike by political friend and foe. Quote, Although his failing health and political temperament combined to make his administration less active than a modern presidency, he earned praise among contemporaries for his solid performance in office. The New York World summed up Arthur's presidency at his death in 1886. No duty was neglected in his administration, and no adventurous project alarmed the nation. Mark Twain wrote of him, quote, I he would be hard indeed to better President Arthur's administration over the 20th and 21st centuries. However, Arthur's reputation mostly faded among the public. Early Life Birth and Family Chester Allen Arthur was born October 5, 1829, in Fairfield, Vermont. The family's frequent moves later spawned accusations that Chester Arthur was not a native-born citizen of the United States. When Arthur was nominated for vice president in 1880, a New York attorney and political opponent, Arthur P. Hinman, initially speculated that Arthur was born in Ireland and did not come to the United States until he was 14 years old. Had that been true, Opponents might have argued that Arthur was constitutionally ineligible for the vice presidency. Under the United States Constitution's Natural Born Citizen Clause Education Arthur spent some of his childhood years living in the New York towns of York, Perry, Greenwich, Lansingburg, Schenectady, and Hoosick. After graduating, Arthur returned to Shattuck and became a full-time teacher and soon began to pursue an education in law. Early Career New York Lawyer When Arthur joined the firm, Culver and New York attorney John J. 
the grandson of the founding father of the same name, were pursuing a habeas corpus action against Jonathan Lemon, a Virginia slaveholder who was passing through New York with his eight slaves. In 1856, Arthur courted Ellen Herndon, the daughter of William Lewis Herndon, a Virginia naval officer. Civil War In 1861, Arthur was appointed to the military staff of Governor Edwin D. Morgan as engineer-in-chief. On April 5, 1882, Arthur was elected to the District of Columbia Commandary of the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, M-O-L-L-U-S. As a third-class companion, the honorary membership category for militia officers and civilians who made significant contributions to the war effort. He was assigned M-O-L-L-U-S insignia number 2430. Arthur returned to being a lawyer, and with the help of additional contacts made in the military, he and the firm of Arthur and Gardner flourished. Arthur's political prospects improved along with his law practice when his patron, ex-Governor Morgan, was elected to the United States Senate. New York Politician Conkling's Machine The New York Custom House Formerly the Merchants Exchange Building at 55 Wall Street was Arthur's office for seven years. The end of the Civil War meant new opportunities for the men in Morgan's Republican machine, including Arthur. At the time, U.S. Custom Houses were managed by political appointees who served as collector, naval officer and surveyor. In 1866, Arthur unsuccessfully attempted to secure the position of naval officer at the New York Custom House, a lucrative job subordinate only to the collector. Conkling succeeded to leadership of the conservative wing of New York's Republicans by 1868 as Morgan concentrated more time and effort on national politics, including serving as chairman of the Republican National Committee. The Conkling machine was solidly behind General Ulysses S. Grant's candidacy for president, and Arthur raised funds for Grant's election in 1868. Shortly thereafter, President Grant gave Conkling control over New York patronage, including the Customs House at the Port of New York. Having become friendly with Murphy over their shared love of horses during summer vacations on the Jersey Shore, Grant appointed him to the collector's position. The Senate confirmed Arthur's appointment. As collector he controlled nearly a thousand jobs and received compensation as great as any federal office holder. Clash with Hayes Arthur's four-year term as collector expired on December 10, 1875, and Conkling, then among the most powerful politicians in Washington, arranged his protege's reappointment by President Grant. Hayes entered office with a pledge to reform the patronage system. In 1877, he and Treasury Secretary John Sherman made Conkling's machine the primary target. Hayes further struck at the heart of the spoils system by issuing an executive order that forbade assessments and barred federal office holders from talk. Arthur's job was only spared until July 1878, when Hayes took advantage of a congressional recess to fire him and Cornell replacing them with the recess appointment of Merritt and Silas W. Burt. Election of 1880 Conkling and his fellow stalwarts, including Arthur, wished to follow up their 1879 success at the 1880 Republican National Convention by securing the nomination for their ally, ex-President Grant. Garfield and his supporters knew they would face a difficult election without the support of the New York stalwarts and decided to offer one of them the vice presidential nomination. As expected, the election was close. The Democratic nominee, General Winfield Scott Hancock, was popular and, having avoided taking definitive positions on most issues of the day, he had not offended any pivotal constituencies as Republicans had done since the end of the Civil War. 
Garfield and Arthur initially focused their campaign on the bloody shirt. The idea that returning Democrats to office would undo the victory of the Civil War and reward secessionists. Vice Presidency Arthur taking the oath of office as administered by Judge John R. Brady at Arthur's home in New York City, September 20, 1881. After the election, Arthur worked in vain to persuade Garfield to fill certain positions with his fellow New York stalwarts, especially that of the Secretary of the Treasury. The stalwart machine received a further rebuke when Garfield appointed Blaine Conkling's archenemy as Secretary of State. The Senate in the 47th United States Congress was divided among 37 Republicans, 37 Democrats, one Independent, David Davis, who caucused with the Democrats, one readjuster, William Mahone, and four vacancies. With the Senate in recess, Arthur had no duties in Washington and returned to New York City. While in Albany on July 2, Arthur learned that Garfield had been shot. More troubling was the lack of legal guidance on presidential succession. As Garfield lingered near death, no one was sure who, if anyone, could exercise presidential authority. Presidency 1881-85 Taking Office Arthur arrived in Washington, D.C. on September 21. Arthur's sister, Mary Arthur McElroy, served as White House hostess for her widowed brother. Arthur quickly came into conflict with Garfield's cabinet, most of whom represented his opposition within the party. He asked the cabinet members to remain until December, when Congress would reconvene, but Treasury Secretary William Wyndham submitted his resignation in October to enter a Senate race in his home state of Minnesota. Civil Service Reform In the 1870s, a scandal was exposed, in which contractors for star postal routes were greatly overpaid for their services with the connivance of government officials, including Second Assistant Postal Secretary Thomas J. Brady and former Senator Stephen Wallace Dorsey. Garfield's assassination by a deranged office seeker amplified the public demand for civil service reform. At first, the act applied only to 10% of federal jobs and, without proper implementation by the president, it could have gone no further. Surplus in the tariff With high revenue held over from wartime taxes, the federal government had collected more than it spent since 1866. By 1882 the surplus reached $145 million. Congress attempted to balance the budget from the other side of the ledger, with increased spending on the 1882 Rivers and Harbors Act in the unprecedented amount of $19 million. Foreign Affairs and Immigration During the Garfield administration, Secretary of State James G. Blaine attempted to invigorate United States diplomacy in Latin America urging reciprocal trade agreements and offering to mediate disputes among the Latin American nations. The 47th Congress spent a great deal of time on immigration, and at times was in accord with Arthur. A more contentious debate materialized over the status of Chinese immigrants. In January 1868, the Senate had ratified the Burlingame Treaty with China, allowing an unrestricted flow of Chinese into the country. As the economy soured after the Panic of 1873, Chinese immigrants were blamed for depressing workmen's wages. In reaction Congress in 1879 attempted to abrogate the 1868 treaty by passing the Chinese Exclusion Act, but President Hayes vetoed it. Naval Reform The Squadron of Evolution at anchor in 1889 after Yorktown had been added, Chicago, Yorktown, Boston, Atlanta. In the years following the Civil War, American naval power declined precipitously, shrinking from nearly 700 vessels to just 52, most of which were obsolete. Civil Rights 
Like his Republican predecessors, Arthur struggled with the question of how his party was to challenge the Democrats in the South, and how, if at all, to protect the civil rights of black Southerners. Other federal action on behalf of blacks was equally ineffective. When the Supreme Court struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875 in the civil rights cases, Arthur expressed his disagreement with the decision in a message to Congress, but was unable to persuade Congress to pass any new legislation in its place. Native American Policy The Arthur administration was challenged by changing relations with Western Native American tribes, health, travel, and 1884 election. Arthur on an expedition in Yellowstone National Park along with Philip Sheridan and Robert Todd Lincoln. Shortly after becoming president, Arthur was diagnosed with Bright's disease, a kidney ailment now referred to as nephritis. As the 1884 presidential election approached, James G. Blaine was considered the favorite for the Republican nomination. But Arthur, too, contemplated a run for a full term as president, administration and cabinet, judicial appointments. Arthur made appointments to fill two vacancies on the United States Supreme Court. The first vacancy arose in July 1881 with the death of Associate Justice Nathan Clifford, a Democrat who had been a member of the court since before the Civil War retirement, death, and memorials. Arthur left office in 1885 and returned to his New York City home. Two months before the end of his term, several New York stalwarts approached him to request that he run for United States Senate, but he declined, preferring to return to his old law practice at Arthur, Neville's and Ransom. After spending the summer of 1886 in New London, Connecticut, he returned home, and became seriously ill and, on November 16, ordered nearly all of his papers, both personal and official, burned. In 1898, the Arthur Memorial statue, a 15-foot, bronze figure of Arthur standing on a bar granite pedestal, was created by sculptor George Edwin Bissell and installed at Madison Square, in New York City. Arthur's and popularity in life carried over into his assessment by historians, and his reputation after leaving office disappeared.